What roles do ports play in our lives and development? What are some ways supply chains have been changing and how does all this affect communities? Uh, today, we will have the opportunity to explore these questions through the experience of our panelists experts. Um, but uh, before to start with the presentations, a kind reminder, reminder please pose your question using the Slido. You can simply enter the, the code shift uh, 2022 on their website and the Q&A question uh, section will appear. Uh, please feel free to upvote uh, questions you like. Um, well, now I give the floor to Tyler to start with our first presentation. So uh, please, Tyler. You're mute, uh, Tyler. Awesome. There we go. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it feels like a combination of it's been forever since I've been at Dalhousie and it also feels like I was just there yesterday. But uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, calling me a quote unquote expert in this. Uh, you know, I just uh, graduated from Dalhousie uh, School of Planning myself uh, two years ago in 2020 from the Bachelor of Community Design program. Uh, since then, I've uh, started working at the port and it's, uh, it's been a pretty uh, interesting journey to say the least, uh, no pun intended. Uh, but hopefully uh, you guys out there uh, find this interesting. And uh, I know when I went through the planning program, we didn't talk overly much about the port. So uh, hopefully this will be a good introduction. And uh, if you guys have any uh, follow-up questions even after this uh, panel discussion, uh, my email is there. So feel free to uh, reach out with any questions you might have. Um, so to start off, uh, you might be wondering, what is a Canadian Port Authority? So essentially uh, in 1999, um, the Canadian government established uh, what's called the Canada Marine Act. And you can kind of compare that to uh, maybe like the Nova Scotia Municipal Government Act. So it's what port authorities in Canada use to kind of govern their uh, govern their decisions and how they they run the business, um, and I say business because we aren't, uh, I guess, technically a uh, a quote unquote government organization. We're uh, an incorporated uh, organization that does operate at arm's length from the government, meaning that we do have to be completely self sufficient. Um, we aren't, uh, you know, reliant on government handouts and. Uh, and whatnot, we have to kind of come up, we have to ensure that our business model is, uh, you know, managed in such a way that our assets, uh, we can take care of everything ourselves and uh, and use the money that we get to go towards all of our infrastructure and community projects that we work on. And uh, speaking of our assets, um, here's a map of what we are responsible uh, for managing. Uh, under uh, the Canada Marine Act and our letters patent. Um, the, uh, the yellow uh, color is just uh, some major stakeholder partners that uh, we share the harbor with, but um, all the green uh, circles there you'll see are, is our property. And uh, for us, we manage uh, just over 265 acres of uh, federally owned uh, land. And um, Everything that you see from McNabb's Island there in is um, what we on the on the water side have navigational jurisdiction over. So uh, we ensure that any kind of ships uh, navigating through the harbor go through uh, our checks and balances to ensure that uh, what they're carrying, uh, whether or not it's dangerous goods or uh, food or uh, any kind of construction supplies, uh, they all have to be checked through our systems to ensure that. Uh, there's nothing that they're carrying that we wouldn't want in our harbors that is going to be damaging to our uh, coastal environment here. Um, it's um, and we also just actually implemented a new um, new system called port control that uh, kind of digitizes that whole process because, because prior to <laughs> this year a lot of this is done manually. But uh, uh, you'll see there's a theme in this uh, presentation that. Uh, as, as ports continue to evolve in this world, we, uh, we're really trying to transition from uh, kind of some historical archaic ways of doing things to uh, kind of 
getting caught up to the to the modern times, <laughs> let's say. But uh, yeah, so other than the container terminals, which a lot of people I think associate the Port of Halifax with, um, uh, we are also responsible for managing two uh, non-containerized uh, terminals, which are responsible for uh, row row, which is roll on roll off cargo. Uh, that's all. The Halifax Grain Ele Elevator is also a part of um, of that uh, general cargo uh, uh, property. And uh, something else that we have is the the seaport, the Halifax Seaport. So that has a kind of a dual function. One, it serves as kind of the home base for uh, crews in Halifax, but it also serves as a sort of buffer uh, from the community uh, to the container terminals. Uh, so um, there's always been kind of this tension between the, the terminals and the adjacent landowners. Uh, but hopefully, you know, through operations of the seaport, it provides a little bit of a buffer. And uh, yeah, so that's a kind of an overview of what we own in the harbor and how this translates uh, into the real world is um, how our facilities are able to connect Halifax and Nova Scotia and Canada to the rest of the world. So this is a screenshot here of uh, all the ships that were en route uh, to the Halifax, uh, Port of Halifax uh, last year there. And you can see that, you know, ships from all across the world uh, go through the, the, the Port of Halifax. And one of the key uh, reasons why is you'll see that orange dotted line there is uh, part of what they call the Great Circle Route. And that uh, goes from the Mediterranean Sea over to New York. And it's, um, the beauty about the Port of Halifax is that we are actually on that great circle route and we are the first uh, port uh, into North America and the last port out of North America. So we see lots of traffic uh, from Europe, from uh, India, uh, all across the world uh, travels that route. And we just so happen to be uh, in a close enough proximity to take advantage of it. Um, Something that, uh, some, so talking about the proximity, I guess, uh, we are able to catch uh, catchment area. Our products are able to go primarily to uh, the Atlantic Canada, but we also serve uh, Quebec, Ontario, and the US Midwest, like Chicago. And um, it's very important that we're able to serve all these uh, as parts of Canada. Um, and I think we're gonna see that importance uh, kind of highlighted here in maybe some of the, the conflicts that are going on between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Um, it's still early days, but you know, we see, we're seeing the, the banning of ships and um, it's, uh, I think we're gonna see lots of exports from Canada going over to Europe to kind of help out uh, what's going on over there. So it's, uh, it's going to be, it's an interesting time for sure. Um, I think we're going to move on next to uh, just the overall economic impacts of the port and the journey of goods. So uh, last year we contributed uh, $3.6 billion to the total economic uh, impact of Nova Scotia. And that includes uh, both uh, direct and indirect uh, uh, money. So like uh, direct costs, uh, direct would be, you know, like, uh, cruise ships coming into Halifax and the, the, in, the employers who are directly associated with uh, port operations. Indirect would be uh, the tourism uh, business owners who are out in Peggy's Cove and in the Valley who benefit from operations at the port. Um, and, <clears throat> sorry, it's, I, I, always, I always thought it was a fantastic uh, statistics, like just the idea that we, it, it directly in, and indirectly help out close to 19,000 people here in you Nova know, Scotia in terms of jobs. I, I always found that interesting, especially where as a port authority ourselves, we, we only employ directly 80 people. So to have that kind of realization that, you know, what we do at the port has a, such a massive ripple effect on the rest of the province is just, just incredible. But uh, moving on from, uh, from that, we're gonna look through, look at some of the, some of the stuff that I find interesting. I guess is maybe from my technical background, uh, some of the, the the specs here. So, 
over the course of a given year, like we'll see more than, you know, 1300 uh, cargo ships from over 150 different countries pass through uh, the port of Halifax. And uh, we're the only uh, Canadian East Coast port that can handle what they call ultra class uh, ships. And some of you guys might have uh, been able to go down to the, the port and see uh, the Marco Polo last year. You know, that's a, a ship that can hold uh, 16,000, uh, they're called TEU, so a 20 foot equivalent unit. So when you see a, a transfer truck that has a, a container on the back of it, that's typically a, a 40 foot equivalent unit. So a TEU would be two of those. Um, no, a, a transfer truck would have two TEU on it. So picture uh, the equivalent of, you know, almost 300,000 trucks. <laughs> that's how much containers go through the port. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry. So as you can see, 2021, we had our biggest year ever for uh, container volume in, in, uh, in the port. And that's a, a function of uh, the idea that over time, products are continuously uh, becoming containerized. So products that historically were shipped on in bulk format that weren't containerized, uh, these business owners are realizing that they might be able to get a better bang for their buck if they are able to containerize uh, their products. And just through economies of scale, uh, they're using container shipping, they can reduce their costs. So that being a function of why we did so well last year. And then also with COVID, uh, you know, people had discre discretionary spending and they, they bought a lot more products from you know, Amazon all across the world. So uh, just an inherent byproduct of that, we had more ships going through the port. Um, <clears throat> on the non-containerized kind of cargo side, so uh, like the grain products, the, uh, the windmill components, that everything that you can't quite fit into a container is con classified as non-container. And we had a massive year last year, and that was uh, a result of um, up at the north end of Halifax at one of our terminals there, you guys might see the big stack of uh, salt that's on the, the terminal that was there. So a big bulk of our, our numbers last year was, was due to that, the salt up in up at Richmond terminals. But it's, uh, other than salt, we, we um, support uh, steel coil for tire making, uh, pulp and paper, uh, farm equipment, uh, we move, uh, quite a bit of goods through our non-container sections as well. Um, here's a couple examples of what some of those ships would look like. I think everyone's seen a container ship here. Uh, the non-container cargo are the ones that have the, the big side, high-sided uh, ships there. And you see in the, the side of the picture, there's, a, there's some farm equipment being rolled off the back of it. And then um, on the bottom right, we have our grain elevator, which uh, supports, uh, which is considered a national strategic asset, I guess you could call it. Just, uh, it's the only grain elevator east of Montreal, I believe, that's in operation right now. And I think it is going to become an important feature as this, uh, as this, I guess, as the Ukraine-Russia thing goes on, because uh, Russia is a very heavy producer of grain products. And if they're gonna stop uh, exporting to other countries, uh, this asset right here, will probably become pretty important for us. And uh, we might have to start exporting Canadian products at a higher rate than maybe what we used to. <clears throat> so I was asked to maybe just uh, touch on food security. And uh, I think just what I was saying there, um, the idea that the assets that we have here uh, on our property, like the grain elevator, uh, being able to provide, um, you know, products to, European country, other countries that, you know, might be in a state where they aren't able to produce their own or acquire their own. Like it's, it's, it's great that we have these facilities here to do that. But on the, the importing side, um, you know, our terminal, uh, we import, uh, we import food products from all over the globe. Uh, any uh, sort of, uh, all your oranges and bananas and grapes and uh, some of your exotic fruits uh, come through the port through uh, uh, containers. Actually, you know, they're all stuffed in there in the, uh, 
the refrigeration unit containers and uh, we have coffee and tea and olive oil. Uh, we got New, Ze uh, New Zealand lamb and Australian beef. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. I could <laughs> talk about this forever, but uh, essentially, you know, without the port, you know, Canadians would have a hard time, I think, uh, I guess like East Coast Canadians would have a hard time kind of acquiring these, uh, these foods uh, from other uh, places around the world. Um, in terms of exports, uh, food security wise, um, the Port of Halifax is really able to help uh, local farmers uh, because get their product to the doorsteps of other countries as well. You know, just uh, Atlantic Canada just isn't a big enough uh, area for these farmers to uh, to be selling off all their product and you know getting a good return on their investment. So. Uh, a lot of these farmers are only a couple hours away by truck from uh, from the port, and in reality, if you think of it, you know, a couple hours from truck uh, away from the port is really a couple hours away from anywhere in the world, right? You know, you, you get your products to the port, and we're able to take it wherever you want. So, it's uh, it's it's just amazing. It's uh, I it, it baffles my mind because we didn't talk about this too much when we were in planning school, and the I've <laughs> learned all this since I. I got here and it's it's uh, quite mind boggling just knowing how close we are to the, how closely we are connected to the rest of the world. Uh, and yeah, I guess to wrap up a little bit, this kind of transitions into what the future of goods movements is gonna look like. Um, like I said, historically ports have just been um, these interfaces between uh, getting product from A to B in an efficient manner because a lot of, uh, road networks and uh, air networks weren't established uh, you know a couple hundred years ago you know it's like uh, shipping was one of the only ways to really get products around and <clears throat> over time we've seen through the increases in technology and um, the the increase in ship designs and uh, just internationalization of, of cargo it's um we're slowly transitioning through these generations of ports and right now halifax we consider ourselves kind of like a like a 4.5 almost a fifth generation port uh right now we're almost just like a fancy landlord who leases our land to the container terminals and uh and let them kind of look after a lot of the operations and we just will collect the money and sit back. But as, as we look past in the past, like it's just sitting back and collecting money just isn't gonna do it uh, for any organization going into the future. You know, you have to, we have to be active participants in our community. We have to be active participants in uh, creating a good environmental uh, stewards of, of the land in our harbor. You know, it's, um, I'd like to say we're getting there and it's gonna take a little bit of time and effort. And uh, that's what makes working at a port uh, so interesting is just being able to be on the forefront of uh, making an impact on, on how goods get passed through Halifax and Nova Scotia and Canada. And, it's uh it's been a it's been a great journey so far and uh i know i just scratched the surface here and you guys i probably have like a ton of questions but i i really appreciate you listening to me here and uh uh like i said if um if you guys want to reach out feel free and uh, i'm sure the organizers here have my contact information so uh again thank you very much for uh for having me and uh i'm looking forward to uh hearing from the rest of the panelists Thank you, Tyler, for this wonderful presentation. It is pretty interesting how you describe the dynamic of the Halifax port. Um, understanding the, the local context is relevant to make accurate decisions. Um, so now it's time for our next presentation. So Eli, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you, Tyler. I, I felt like I learned a lot. I live really close to the port. And I was like, wow, I didn't know all these things you were sharing, but, um, sorry guys. Okay, 
can you see my presentation? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, so my name is Alisama and um, I am, I have a background in oceanography and marine management. And I also have been working for three or more years with ports and shaping decarbonization and climate and social justice. I conduct social research and development for inspiring communities. And um, I think with this brief introduction, you start to realize that my background and my work, it's complex and different in terms of trying to connect nature um, and research and um, social work. And that's, that's how I approach uh, shipping ports, nature and climate. It's by looking at them as integrated, integrating systems with people in nature. And I hope that my presentation today will give you lots to think about and reflect about how these systems are connected. And I expect that you leave this presentation with more questions than answers. And if that's the case, then <laughs> I achieved my goal. Um, well, to start, I would like to invite you and that will connect nicely with what Tyler was sharing with us to look around you and look at the things you have right now in your desk, living room, I don't know if you're in a cafe or at home, and it's such a think about where the things you have came from, right? And for me, I have this candle here and when I look at it, I saw that it came from London, UK. And Tyler also mentioned that, you know, the farmers here, are they just like a couple of kilometers away from the world by just being connected with the ports. So when you look at these things we have around and realize that most of it came in a vessel, in fact, a study showed that about 90%, 90% of everything we have, we buy came in a vessel. And we look again and we realize that we have so many things. <laughs> we start to realize that the size of shipping operation is really big and it's growing to just match the level of consumption and needs of our society. Um, so shipping plays this very important role in global trade and connect people and places and goods. But with this huge scope and responsibility comes lots of impacts. And even though he listed some of the environmental impacts, when I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about them, I'm going to mention you know, some of the connections with peoples and places. So perhaps the most common one, when I say common, it's like what people know the most about are the oil spills connected to shipping. And vessels, virtually all vessels in the world, international vessels, they use heavy fuel oil. And this is a dirty, toxic fuel that when released in the marine environment, kill everything there. And it's really hard to clean and last for a long time. And the reason why the shipping industry uses this fuel is because it's the cheapest fuel, right? And when you think about logistics, you need to uh, take into consideration the cost of moving things. Uh, but vessels are also associated with emissions, um, emissions connected with climate change, greenhouse gases, but all the pollutants that are directly connected with um, human health. So many studies, especially in the US, in the, on the West Coast, show the relationship between port communities um, respiratory problems with vessels emissions in these areas. Um, vessels are also connected with underwater noise and ship strikes and these two aspects are related with marine mammals uh, strikes which can lead or not to death but because it's a shared space between 
logistics, transportation, people, goods, and nature, um, it's important to consider the, the, the role this industry plays for the health of marine animals. Uh, investors are also connected with invasive species, habitat destruction, and disruption food security. And food security is it's quite important as, you know, I always walk in the waterfront and there is also always someone fishing something there. And we need to understand how the shared space with vessels and port will impact the ability of communities to access, to have access to food. Well, what's up with ports then in this context? Right, like now that we understand a little bit more about the shipping, which is this how we moving things, and then vessels arrive at ports. So the environmental impacts of vessels they exist in the port area because vessels are like houses, right? Everything that we do in a house, we do in a vessel. And by the way, I didn't say that, but I worked as a back hand in a vessel in 2012, so I was many months just traveling a vessel and work day. And everything that we do in the house, we do in a vessel as well. And everything's moved by the fuel we are burning. So, you know, when you go do your necessities, you flush it or the water, you know, goes to a treatment system in the urban area, but in a vessel, it has to be done there. And then you can imagine that it comes with lots of impacts. But also ports are positioned in a place that's a very interesting and unique one because shipping in the middle of the ocean is just so hard to regulate. Imagine trying to cover the entire ocean to be regulating what vessels are doing. It's virtually impossible. But then when they arrive at ports, you can not only regulate what they are doing there, but you can check the books and see what they did before, right? So puts at this very interesting space where we truly connect the dots between the marine systems and on like land-based ones. Um, but ports also have impacts on their own. Um, as Tyler showed us, and the scope and area and size of operation. And because the ports are placed in a coastal area, any conversation about extinction improvement will come with direct impacts in coastal areas, right? And this is, these are not only impacts uh, in the water and the coastal environment, but also increases the conflict between the users of the area and the port's activities. For instance, here where I live, very close to the port and the waterfront, you know, trucks come and then you have, every day you have a traffic that you know it's related to the port and um, the trucks coming to the area. But ports, um, a structure uh, also can also bring lots of environmental impacts and they last for a long time because the port structure it's a asset right that stays there for a long time as well as I think the impact related to it and as I mentioned before when vessels our airports, they still burning the fuel and the emissions are happening that are affecting the poor communities. But one interesting thing that I wanna now take you to, you know, get a little bit deeper is to think about ports and shipping as enablers of social and economic systems. So Tyler mentioned before the connection between Halifax port with the war. And this is not the first time that we can connect, right? The Halifax port with the war that happened and the, um, um, the World War as well, the second one. And um, ports play a very interesting position with the shipping system. When we think, for instance, about COVID and how in many communities in the Caribbean region, they were affected by the cruise shipping. They were coming with infected people with um, people uh, infected with COVID. But if we go a bit 
before, back, you know, in the 16th century, and we think about the enslavement trade system, we're going to see how shipping ports played such an important role in keeping that system running. The only way that, you know, free people moved from Africa to other parts of the world to become slaves there was because there was a system of shipping and ports enabling that um, operation. So um, I'm checking the time and I, I think I'm okay with time still, but this is my, um, pump up on my last slide, yeah. And this is not supposed to be um, an, an exhaustive list of Challenges and challenges, and, sorry, challenges and opportunities, but to give us a little bit more to reflect about and connect uh, the dots we're discussing here. But when we think about, you know, the future of goods and connected with the present, uh, we need to think about ports and shipping in the context of what society want to see in the future, right? Because it doesn't matter if we're trying to change the pieces and we are not trying to change the scope of it. And when I say that, I refer, for instance, um, to consumption and how much we are actually moving and what we are moving. So we are seeing some um, shipping companies, for instance, refusing to carry coal because, you know, in terms of climate change, coal is very damaged. Um, and we see the industry imposing a rule that connects directly with a transition to decarbonization. And ports are just so well positioned to play that role as well. So when we think about decarbonization in a future where the systems that move goods around the globe are green, the investment in this system, 90%, 90% will happen on the land and not in the ocean itself. So we're talking about infrastructure on the land side that will support the system in the ocean. So ports are just so well positioned to bridge this gap. So when we think, for instance, about any emissions connected with ports communities, if ports are connected with a renewable energy grid, vessels could plug in, and instead of burning fossil fuel, they would be using the energy um, from the ports, right? But again, the ports need to <laughs> use an energy source that's renewable, otherwise it's just burning oil elsewhere and not um, in the port area. But another thing when we think about ports and marine um, animals and that connection between nature, wildlife and ports, they also play a very important role. So as I mentioned before, underwater noise and ship strikes can be regulated by ports when they create what we call slow speed zones. And um, underwater noise and strikes with mammals are directly connected with the speed of vessels. So on the west coast of Canada and BC, they have, uh, they mapped out the roads of, you know, whales and other marine mammals and where these um, migratory roads connected with vessels, um, lanes, uh, shipping lanes. And in these areas, they created a slow speed zone and that decreases by half the chance of a strike killing a whale um, if there is an encounter between a vessel and a whale. Um, ports can do that not by only creating mechanisms that say stop, but also by incentivizing vessels to do the right thing. So we have seen in many ports, um, you know, um, taxes being re uh, reductions in taxes um, and how much they charge the vessels if the vessels comply with environmental regulations related to greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. Um, but in terms of governance, ports are, you know, 
I could call ports like a, a cool bar where everyone wants to go and have, you know, a great conversation. Because if we think about the pieces and governance structures of ports, they are just so well positioned to bring different stakeholders to the table and discuss local, regional, local and regional sustainable practices for the ocean and also coastal communities. As Tyler mentioned, you know, ports are positioned here, but they are connected with rural communities and other communities um, across the province. Um, but this structure of, you know, having different pieces, land, uh, marine, um, and, you know, levels of government um, thinking and um, managing ports can also be a barrier, right? Because we have too many pieces and it's hard to say who is accountable and responsible for what. And ports, as I mentioned before, they are collaborative in nature, but it's still a piece with communities and especially understanding, community understanding of ports impacts and making the connection between, you know, public health emissions and operations in port and marine areas. Um, as I mentioned before, these connections could be directly translated into improvement of water air quality for these coastal communities. And I think that's it from my end. I tried to make sure I was on time. Um, and I am happy to take any questions and I really appreciate the opportunity. So I jumped straight into the presentation because I want to make sure I'll not um, spend more than I had. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie, for this great presentation. Thank you for exploring with us the role of challenges, impacts, and opportunity of ports. Uh, certainly uh, a very interesting topic. Um, OK, uh, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Hassan for uh, the next presentation. So please, Dr. Hassan, start uh, whenever you, you like. Thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our um, shift conference. Very well organized so far. We have the first uh, keynote speaking, as well as this uh, uh, tremendous uh, session on goods movement. Uh, just a second. I can't see the slide. My apology. Perfect. And uh, we have already heard from two to uh, two to a presentation thus far, and and one uh, directly from the port of Halifax. And and Tyler uh, did a very good segue for this presentation as well. At the same time, our second um, panelist uh, offered uh, a very uh, a great synopsis of different costs and benefits of the port, including um, some uh, mention of uh, emissions and other social costs when when ports are nearby. So, so today I will more focus on this goods movement and emissions, like what's happening in in local local area, and my my presentation will be more geared about the quantification of those goods movement as well as emission in port city of Halifax. I would like to also uh, bring some uh, critical issues that planning may consider moving forward, including online shopping, delivery truck, just not on the, on the port side, but every city is looking at other kinds of goods movement and commercial vehicle movement. So we'd like to also highlight a couple of those issues as I move forward. Uh, <clears throat> So as we all know, like uh, historically, whenever we are talking about transportation, people were talking about mobility of people. Mobility of goods, although it has a bigger impact, you will see even in my transportation research side, very limited studies 
Um, but for Halifax, it's a very important aspect, as we have, um, you saw from Tyler's presentation, um, have these container terminal, intermodal uh, terminals, as well as many facilities that, that make this city possible, feasible, and also uh, growing uh, together with that for, port facility. But very few, um, in general, uh, uh, there was a good discussion about the flows, estimation of emissions, and really understanding what that port role can go. I can go on and on on this issue because there are some governance issues like who does what type of operation exist from the port side uh, as well as city traffic side. But this is not probably the topic for today. We will try to see that it is important in addition to the movement of people, we should look more deeply on the goods movement. That's very important for transportation planning, for land use planning, and for various other reasons. Um, and, and if we look at literature, like even internationally, Doug Hunt is one of the biggest uh, name in this area. Um, uh, there are very limited travel demand forecasting for the commercial vehicle. There are many reasons for that. One is the data challenge. It's not like just households to, to observe about. The more critical one is the delivery truck movement, which is interzonal, like very, very limited planning, modeling, or even deeper dive on how these things are going on. Particularly, this is becoming much more a bigger issue when we are thinking about online shopping and COVID-19 restrictions has now made it again bigger. So, uh, so it's, it's important to understand this urban delivery truck, not only for the businesses, but also now it's becoming more important for the residential area. So Port has those long haul trucks and other kinds of uh, pieces, but also in urban transportation system, we have this commercial vehicle movement in residential neighborhood, even like many people um, nowadays, like observe like from their home, there are so many, so many deliveries going on from Amazon Prime to any other, any other survey del delivery. So last mile problem is becoming a big problem in transportation planning to dive uh, deep, uh, dig deeper to understand how we should be planning for our infrastructure, road infrastructure, as well as different kinds of neighborhoods. So in this work, what we started with is try to develop a transportation network model for Halifax and try to then model more specifically this local truck movement, truck delivery movement, which is uh, we do not do not have even data for these type of things because it's it's such a multi stakeholders very complex supply chain issues. Uh, so we try to do that and we try to represent that within traffic, try to estimate traffic as well as the emissions. So that's what I will be mainly presenting from uh, from a couple of our master's students and PhD students working on our network, as you all probably have seen from Tyler, the port side, but this is the representation of all the reds are the, 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 the roads we coded in our uh, modeling system. We have traffic analysis zone of 222. Uh, and it has a process to develop this process. We cannot simply run uh, commercial vehicle movement without doing the passenger movement because they both share the road space. So we did that. Uh, but for your uh, information, for the goods movement side, uh, data was a big, big problem. But for the long haul track generation, uh, we couldn't get much data from our local uh, local local units. So we relied on the short GPS tracking data, which has 56,000 Canadian owned trucks, which includes start time, end time, duration, uh, location of the truck, those type of things. And then for the delivery truck, we try to utilize a more innovative way of like estimating that because observed data for the tele delivery truck, such as the long haul is not available. So we use business establishment data. We bought that and then we tried to see simulate that based on some uh, trip chains or tour that, that each of the segments of um, uh, Canadian businesses does that. So this is more of like uh, where I am proud of and we got a couple of publications done is how to do this delivery truck, uh, tr truck modeling. So we had this for Nova Scotia, 27,000 farms records for industry, retail, service, transportation, and wholesale. So we try to come up with their trip rate and we try to do the tour because um, 
delivery truck is not just from one place to another. It might go in multiple places. It might have multiple legs. And then that's the whole true tour, unlike like our, our passenger or movement of people. So we, we try to get those from uh, or generate those from we generated start time, end time, try to see how that goes with, uh, with uh, our distribution that we got from our other data sets. Particularly, we use Peel region data set because there is no local HRM, commercial vehicle movement survey. That's very strange, despite we are a port city. Uh, very strange, not in the last 20 years, there is none. Uh, on those. So, so we, we utilize this Monte Carlo method to generate and synthesize and, and those, those, those movements. So these are a couple of origin and destinations we came up with. So on the left hand side, on the blue, uh, blue graph, you can see uh, the long haul truck movement that looks like higher in the morning peak period. And in the right hand side bottom, uh, you'll see by service uh, industry, by industry category, um, so you'll see um, uh, the retail is a little bit, the red one is the retail, retail, and these are prior to COVID. I believe this went much more up uh, at this point uh, because uh, there are lots of lots of uh, home deliveries happening uh, at this point. So we tried to generate those for uh, every hour, for 14 hour period for the, for the city. And from that, we try to also we generated all assignments on the road with the passenger traffic because we have another model of the passenger traffic. So we tried to generate them, uh, their traffic flows on road street and calibrated and validated based on our observed traffic data, both tr uh, truck as well as car. So these are some of the equations to do that. But the most important part here is it's very close to uh, one means R square means like we have a quite a bit of confidence on, on using this model for emission estimation. Um, and we did much more uh, work and don't worry on those. These are mainly for the PhD student for getting their uh, degrees, but they try to develop some sort of methodologies to see those, those calibrations and validations make sense. Uh, from, from our point of view. Then you started looking at the results, trying to visualize those spatially. So if you look at the trip production and attraction for the long haul truck, you'll see mainly concentrated in the, in the port area. In the port area, the, from the zoomed, uh, zoomed one, you can see the interesting one is the delivery truck because it was never done even in various places around the world. So you'll see the last uh, two, two graph shows, I believe the wholesale, uh, the wholesale and the services is the middle. So you can see where the uh, delivery truck truck tour legs are produced in different areas, mainly our urban core, as well as uh, Dartmouth Crossing, you can see lots of lots of movement happening. So we tried to uh, develop those, those understanding those numbers, and these are more distribution yeah, spatially uh, shown for it. This is the traffic volume by link, as you can see, um, uh, on the both bridges are very, very important for uh, commercial truck movement. Uh, and, and this is the highest, highest volume that we captured. The blue line is the long haul tracks. One or two bound is the highest, highest, but there are also Windsor and other connections there. Um, so we have a very good understanding of the volume. After we did that, we try to utilize those traffic volume to do emission estimation, GHG, NOx, SOx, uh, vol uh, VOC, volatile um, uh, VOC, THC, all that matters for public health. And, and, and this is the results of that uh, per hour in, in HRM. Um, in HRM, so you can see uh, uh, for each hour delivery truck contributions, long haul truck com contributions for GHG, Cox, Knox. And this is very important, like which our one of the speaker uh, really um, mentioned about. Uh, since port is in the down peninsula, like most of these emissions are happening through those uh, residential areas, commercial areas, street pathways. So 
in, in certain way, we don't realize our port is much more intrinsically related with our daily lives and with our daily commute and walking, biking in, in, the, in the peninsula area. So you can see tremendous amount of particularly long haul diesel. Diesel is one of the, one of the uh, biggest contributions, a contributor in terms of emissions, uh, GHG gas uh, emissions and other kinds, but local uh, delivery truck also have some, 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 some contributions there too. And you can see is that we also split up urban, suburban, and rural areas five times more in the urban core. So see, you, that's, that's a very important to look at carbon dioxide, snog, socks. And our population is also very concentrated on that area. So we need to really rethink about like what should be our track route or alternative track route, or even sometimes some more bold ideas about re relocating port or looking at other alternatives to, to minimize those those harmful impact particularly pm 2.5 and pm 10 those are very very uh, 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 harmful harmful um, emissions uh, uh, for the public health point of view so key key findings of course is is a majority of uh, total truck uh, in the uh, is produced 53 percent from urban core and lots of long haul truck and lots of delivery truck that surprised me though 43.9 uh, percent but i believe this number has shifted enormously or significantly uh, during uh, this online shopping surge, local deliveries. So we'll probably do another study very soon just to understand what's going on in suburban areas in terms of delivery truck. We at least have the modeling framework. Bridges are very important. So those are critical infrastructure, particularly from a commercial uh, movement point of view. Um, and and a long haul truck, um, uh, their contributions to emissions is high, and we are we are very highly polluting um, uh, area, particularly for the commercial truck movement. We, we do not realize that, or even I haven't seen much uh, much of those recognitions in various uh, planning documents in in, in HRM. Uh, for the planning and policy consideration, I I, I think there are uh, needs to seriously think about our truck routing. Uh, right now, the Hollis Street, um, like there are dedicated truck routes, so those those are very important. And I I touched on the relocations or even rethinking about our port, um, and and policies guiding drive delivery trucks. I think this is very very important, uh, particularly with 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 uh, with, the, with the change in our shopping habits, changing uh, various kind of things that in the suburban and rural area and delivered truck movement, modeling, observation, data collection. That's another uh, piece probably we need to start uh, looking at so that we can make informed decision. Online shopping, COVID-19, uh, these, these, this is, I, I, I already mentioned about that. I, I think this is one of the, one of the biggest uh, area for us to emphasize for uh, journeys with goods uh, because it's evolving the evolution of delivery truck, the evolution of commercial movement trucks. Even you can see Amazon has ordered 100K uh, uh, trucks from Rivian in, uh, in uh, electric vehicle uh, trucks. So, so we need to start thinking through electrification of those, those fleet uh, and also thinking about how we can manage delivery trucks since our uh, this uh, habit uh, is changing. So the goods movement, not only with the poor, but also within communities are becoming much more important. Thank you very much for listening to, to this. And my acknowledgement is Pauline and all the terrific graduate students who work on very cool stuff. I learn a lot from them every day and also try to guide them to learn more about our city. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your presentation. Grace has the other presentations. Uh, we really appreciate your enthusiasm for sharing your knowledge about such an important topic for planners. Uh, then we don't have too much time, but uh, we will uh, move quickly to the Q&A uh, section. So I would like to start with the question with uh, more likes. Uh, so the, the, the question is, uh, what impact do you think sea level rise will have on goods movement particularly ports, are, and are any mitigation strategies being planned to address them? Uh, whoever wants can start. Uh, 
Uh, I can talk to that really briefly. Um, I guess in Halifax here, we're fortunate that a lot of our uh, infrastructure in terms of goods movement through the port. Uh, historically, we have uh, developed our infrastructure uh, quite a bit above the, the high uh, watermark. So right now, I wouldn't say we're in too much jeopardy. However, we are cognizant of all the studies uh, of sea level rise. So when we do implement um, new projects on our property, we ensure that um, the longevity of the product of the of the projects are uh, in play in mind when we're developing when we're developing them when we're designing them. So yes, we are designing to uh, counteract some of the sea level rise. But uh, what we can do in the short term is um, just uh, we've actively increased our uh, our participation in. Uh, local, national, and international uh, initiatives. So uh, uh, the Green Marine Act, uh, Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, we, we're continuously trying to improve our own practices to ensure the, the longevity of the port and uh, surrounding community and assets. So, so the, the quick calls notes on that, I guess. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your question and, and answers. Um, unfortunately, uh, from Dornality, we don't have uh, too much time. So uh, Taylor, Ellie, and Dr. Asen, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your uh, ideas with us. Uh, these are certainly nothing, not uh, something we talk about in planning every day. And there is uh, the importance of these topics, uh, the role of sports, the local context, considering that we live in a, a coastal city and the importance of transportation, all interesting topics. Uh, uh, now I give the podium to Urhas again. Uh, again, thank you, thank you all. Uh, so Sherry, uh, please. Yeah, thank you so much for such an interesting discussion as well as the slides and the information. Um, you know, looking at the movement of goods as well as a little bit about the impacts of uh, climate on those um, journeys of goods as we talked about. Um, so now we're gonna uh, take time for our lunch break. Um, thank you so much again for um, this very interesting discussion. So we'll be back at 2 p.m. Um, and our next theme is gonna be the journey of places, um, which has a different Zoom link. Um, so please um, get a look at that. And yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Hi, everyone. How are you feeling? Are, are, am I, are the panelists staying on the call, or am I, uh, am I free? <laughs> yeah, one sec. Okay, now nah, everyone's gone. <laughs> so, well, should maybe I, have mentioned that the panelists should stay back because I think yeah. Ellie and Dr. Hassan just left. Yeah, they left. Yeah, because they weren't here when we discussed that we would stay for a very brief checkout, but that's okay. I will follow up with them. Yeah.